Your Excellency, Adama Barrow, President of the Republic of the Gambia, and Lady Barrow, Your Excellency, Lady Chilel, Your Excellency, Lady Njeme, uh, Dauda Jawara Junior, and the members of the Jawara family, Madam Speaker of the National Assembly, Honorable Ministers, Your Lordships of the Superior Courts, members of the Diplomatic Corps, distinguished guests. Two days ago, with the passing away of Alaji Sadaura Kairawa Jawara, <clears throat> the first president of the Republic of the Gambia, our nation lost its founding father. Africa lost its champion for human rights. And the global community lost a great humanist. On behalf of the judiciary, which he respected so much and to which he gave so much, and on my own personal behalf, I would like to extend our deepest condolences to His Excellency, the President of the Republic of the Gambia, to Lady Chilel and to Lady Njeme, and to the Jawara family, to the whole Gambian nation, and those who are abroad friends and relatives and well-wishers. And I pray that Allah grant him al -Jana, that Allah continue to guide and protect his family, and that Allah continues to guide and protect this nation, which he loved so much, this nation to which he gave so much. I have had the privilege and the honor, indeed, of serving, working with Sadauda as his Attorney General and as his Minister of Justice for a period of 10 years, precisely from July 1984 to July 1994. In that period, I have come to benefit from his excellent qualities as a statesman, as a leader, and as a great humanist. Sadar is one of two personalities with whose, from whom I benefited with whose interaction I benefited, the other being my late father, Shiala Yukazir Jalutijan Redelao of Bansan. And I regarded both of them as my parents, as my mentors. And I pray that Allah grant both of them Al Janna, Al Janna, Al In the 95 highly productive years of his life, Sir Dauda has achieved important milestones for the Gambia and the wider international community. We all know, of course, that he led the struggle for independence of the Gambia, its liberation from colonialism, and its emergence into independence and sovereign nationhood. As a teenager, I was privileged to witness that ceremony in the evening of 17th February, 1965, as a young boy at the Makati Square, where I sat in the crowd and saw the Union on Jack being lowered and the Gambia national flag being hoisted and the handover of the instruments of independence by the Duke of Kent, who was representing Her Majesty, the Queen of England, handing it over to the then Prime Minister, Dauda Kairaba Jawara. At that time, many were quite skeptical of the chances of this, what they called, improbable nation surviving as an independent nation, given the challenges we faced in terms of our size, land size, in terms of our size of our population, uh, in terms of the paucity of our resources. But Sardauda made us all confident as a nation, and he made us believe in ourselves and in our ability to do so to survive as an independent nation. 54 years later, that supposedly improbable nation is a firmly established member and a respectable member of the international community. Sadawada's confidence and leadership inspired us and indeed enabled us to prove the skeptics wrong in the course of time.
We continue, of course, to be a developing country, facing many challenges, like many others. But those who have experienced both the colonial era and the post-independence post era, as I have done, and I believe as many also in this gathering have done, will recognize honestly the tremendous progress that the Gambia made in all spheres, in education, in health, in infrastructure, governance, agriculture, the tremendous progress it made despite its challenges in the period between 1965 and 1994. The record is there for all persons to visit and, and look at very, very objectively. Pursad Dauda and his government took the country very far from the colonial period. Despite the modest means and conditions inherited on 18 February 1965, but it was not only a question of a focus or an emphasis as a state and his successive government on, on the material aspects uh, of, of the state. Sadauda and his successive governments injected a quality of governance into our national fabric, which was remarkable and it was rare at the time in Africa. His most significant contribution to this nation did not lie on the material side, important as that is, and also important that there are many achievements in that area as well. At a time when, at a time when one dictat when dictatorship, when one party rule, when violations of human rights in the name of national unity and progress seem to be the order of the day in Africa. Sa Daura Jawara, almost alone, almost alone, and perhaps you could count other exceptions, such as Senegal and Botswana at the time. But almost alone, he stood among his peers and stood for a different philosophy and for a different policy of governance. He stood for and made the Gambia known for good governance based on respect for the rule of law, on respect for human rights, guaranteed by our constitution, on the independence of the judiciary, on freedom of assembly and association, on political pluralism, and, and the holding of regular free, fair elections. As his attorney general and minister of justice, and from my many interactions from, with him at both the state and indeed at the party levels, I came to realize that the concepts, the principles of fairness, of justice, of respect for the law, and respect for human rights, were personal tenets for Sadao. He did not adhere to them as a matter of political expediency. He deeply believed in them. He believed that development is a comprehensive concept and process that embraces not only material aspects, but particularly all those other aspects of life which maintain and enhance the personal dignity, the dignity of the human being. He respected the law immensely, and he would not tolerate any breach of it, no breach particularly of the Constitution. As Attorney General, my experience was, it would suffice if I told him that would not conform with the law, and that door would be closed. There was no further action on that. He made sure that he respected, and he made sure everybody around him also scrupulously uh, respected the law. But he, he did not rest on his oars throughout his tenure as president, as leader uh, of this country. He continued to explore other ways of strengthening and deepening our governance infrastructure. And this le led to many, many local initiatives and, and important results, such as, for instance, the direct election to the office of the president, which was not the case on this is of this National Assembly, used to be responsible for electing the president. Sarawla felt, no, the people of the country need to be given a voice directly to de decide that important issue. And hence, the, so the constitution was changed, and then from 1982, the people at the grassroots level were empowered to choose their leader, as it should be. That was one of his, his initiatives. 
In, he took other initiatives, for instance, perhaps now we may, some of us may not remember, but prisoners at mile two used to be bound with leg irons and with handcuffs. And Sadada found that absolutely intolerable. He gave a written order that henceforth those practices were to, dis were to, were to, were to stop, they were to cease, because he believed they were inhumane and in violation of the fundamental rights of prisoners. Unfortunately, I'm, I'm afraid some years after his departure, the practice resurfaced. We have to be on our guard, all of us, to make sure that those practices do not continue, because they often really the principles of, of respect to human rights. His concern for, the, for, for fairness and justice and humane treatment also led to the important decision he made in the early 90s, leading to the abolition of the death penalty in this country. That was a, a remarkable step because he believed the death penalty constituted cruel, inhumane, and unfair and unjust treatment. Uh, and, and unfortunately, we've seen some regression in that respect, but fortunately, we have come back to South Africa's viewpoint with the decision by His Excellency President's government that the death penalty will be abolished and not applied anymore. The attempted coup d'etat of 1981 which, which resulted in widespread violence, in, in a number of deaths, and uh, dam extensive damage and destruction of property, required the declaration of a state of emergency, as a result of which, for instance, many people were detained. Uh, they were processed through review tribunals. Some were prosecuted, some were acquitted, some were convicted. Despite the fact that this was a state of emergency, Sarada was strict in ensuring, in requiring, that all those involved in the process should adhere to the rules of law, that everything that was done should conform with the highest international standards on, on human rights. And I'm, I'm pleased to remind you, the National Assembly, that at the end of the day, even Amnesty International was able to certify that the arrests and detentions and the trials of all those uh, relating to the 1981 attempt were carried out in accordance with the international human rights standards that, are, that were recognized by, by the international uh, community. He would not accept, because there was a state of emergency, he would not accept that the standards of fair trial, the standards for treatment of prisoners uh, or detainees uh, should be deviated from. He did not regard that as an acceptable excuse. And he insisted that the standards ought to be maintained. The establishment of the Ombudsman was another one. We, we can have a, a long list. We cannot finish the list today because of time constraints. But he, and one area he was concerned with also was in ensuring, for instance, that ordinary citizens do not become victims of abuse by the administrative machinery, by the machinery of government. And that if they do become victims, that they should have an easy, accessible, expeditious way of resolving that. And this led to his decision again in the early 90s that an M ombudsman ought to be established for this country to serve citizens. Sadawda indeed made my job as Attorney General a very easy one because he was himself the champion of legality. He was the champion of constitutionalism. And he was the champion of respect for human rights and the rule of law. And if as Attorney General you have a head of state who of that kind, it makes your, your, your struggle much, much easier. But his, com his concern for good governments was, however, not confined to the domestic sphere of the Gambia only. It became a part and parcel of the Gambia's foreign policy. And that policy saw the Gambia initiating many, many important steps, taking many initi uh, important initiatives uh, within international organizations. The Gambia never hesitated, uh, irrespective of which country was concerned, to speak out publicly, if need be, against violations of human rights by any country. And so he, he sat out almost alone in Africa, was the one who stood up and condemned what was happening in Uganda under the then dictator Idi Amin. And this led to his proposal also for, uh, for the establishment of a human rights unit within the Commonwealth Secretariat. That proposal was accepted, and all of us in the Commonwealth uh, owe a debt of gratitude to His Excellency the President, Sadawra Karabajara, that that unit, since the 1970s, 
is functioning and serving all the, uh, the, the members, all the citizens uh, of, of the Commonwealth. He thought also we needed to move further in Africa to establish our own international machinery in order to promote and protect human rights across na uh, national frontiers. And so in the meeting, in the summit in Liberia in the 1970s, he was uh, the one who proposed the establishment of an African Commission on, on Human and People's Rights. Uh, those negotiations, which I had the privilege to be involved in as a junior law officer at the time, uh, were concluded in 1981 with the adoption of the African Charter on Human and People's Rights in Nairobi, Kenya, after two rounds of meetings in Banjul. And after a lot of uh, expense and effort by His Excellency the President, uh, Sadao, out that make sure, to ensure that the effort was not aborted. And again, in honor of, in the cognition of the important role that Sadauda and this country had played in that very, very important process, the official title name of the charter has come to be known as the Banjul Charter. It's the Banjul Charter in recognition and in honor of the role that he has played. That's been, that's been one of his most remarkable achievements as well. And in addition, of course, as our brother uh, OJ has indicated, uh, the second step was taken of ensuring, of giving the, the country, the Gambia, the, the privilege, the honor of hosting the commission where it has stayed since its inception. Within the Gambia also, we have the establishment by Sardar's government of the African Center for Democracy and Human Rights Studies. It has matured since the early 80s into the premier non-governmental, African non-governmental institution responsible for human rights. It has become the umbrella now under which all African human rights NGOs operate. And annually we see them in Banyul here, from every country meeting here as non-governmental organizations, uh, examining the challenges of governance in Africa, coming up with recommendations to government, coming up with recommendations to, 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 the, to the Human Rights Commission uh, and to the Human Rights Court itself. Fostering national unity and solidarity was one of his primary concerns. Small as the Gambia is in, in many respects, it is a reflection of what is in, in Africa in terms of its uh, diversity and therefore the challenges that arise from that. But Sadao does throw very actively to well our diverse peoples into a united nation. He encouraged us to rise beyond tribal, beyond religious, and beyond sectional differences. And I saw this in, in many things he did. I saw this in the way he transformed, for instance, the People's Protective Party into a truly national and not a sectional organization. I, I saw this also in, in the way after every election, after every national election, in the way he constituted his cabinet, he paid attention to diversity in terms of gender, in terms of religion, in terms of tribe, in terms of geography. And if you look at every cabinet that Sadawda established, you will see it really reflected the diversity of the country. It was a conscious effort on his part always to make sure that that very high instrument of governance uh, reflected the, the country itself. I saw this also in his interaction with people. People, he interacted very well with people of all sections, all tribes, all sections, all levels, all, 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 all religions. And I saw this in the trust and the confidence that they had in him. Eventually, each of us comes from a tribe. But eventually, Sadauda really became a tribeless person. He became a tribeless person. He was a Gambian, a true Gambian, a true nationalist, one who rose above tribe, one who rose above religion, and one who rose above section. I remember him for many other things for his great intellect, for his punctuality. And this is something we need to emulate together with all his other qualities, his punctuality, his courtesy, and his kindness. He was never disrespectful to anybody, irrespective of your status. He may disagree with you, but he respected even his subordinates. He was always polite and courteous, but he was firm. He was compassionate. He was considerate. He was never one to abuse the powers that the law gave him. 
He tried to exercise his powers, to, to exercise his, his authority to carry out its functions without having to rely on the coercive authorities that the law gave him. He rarely did that. He, he, he worked on consensus and on convincing people to come to his point of view, to understand and to accept his point of view. These are very, very important attributes uh, on his part. And he was a man of God. He was a man of God with a very strong faith. And I was struck in this respect by one particular incident when I was his attorney general. During one particular Ramadan, he had given me an assignment to, to, to complete. I had finished it just after Maghrib prayers, and I drove to his residence in Fajara to, to deliver it. Now, when I entered the compound, I actually found, it seemed, all the residents of the Fajara resident, of the Fajara house, were already in rows waiting for the nafila, to do the nafila for the Ramadan. And Sadawda was standing in front of them with rosary beads in hand, ready to lead them in this long nafila. I didn't say anything. I handed him whatever the documents I had been working on. And I left. But at that point in time, what struck me was actually this man I was looking at was both a president and an imam. And, th and that's what struck me, that he, this was the president and the imam. Several years later, several months later, sorry, not years, I, I related this incident to my father, the Imam of Mansang. And his, and his response was this, that, well, if he wasn't president, he would have been a Sheikh al-Islam. And that was, that was his response to me. And I think it was the right thing. He had the qualities of a good religious leader as well. He had a strong faith and the qualities of a religious leader. There are many, many things, positive things, for which we can remember Sadawda, ranging from his statesmanship, his achievements, his personal qualities. And we have good reason to say, Alhamdulillah, to the Almighty God, for having given us the benefit of this great person, the benefit of his presence, his leadership, and his guidance for so many years. But as a nation, we must not only dwell in remembrance and memory. We must not just dwell on remembering these qualities of the father of the nation. In these particularly difficult times of transition, transformation, and change, we must, we must rededicate ourselves to those qualities, to those values, to those ideals for which he stood. And those who are respect for the law, respect for the rule of law, respect for human rights and democratic principles, the promotion and maintenance of peace, of national unity and solidarity, our adherence at an individual personal level to the values of tolerance and patience and respect in our relationships with each other. We must continue and inculcate an abiding commitment to progress, to social justice, and to prosperity of our community. In that way, we can, each of us, and collectively together, contribute to the continued success of the Gambia Project. I call it the Gambia Project, launched by Sadauda on the 18th of February, 1965. And that project had a simple objective. It was to maintain the sovereignty and independence of the Gambia and to strive for a peaceful, for a progressive, and for a prosperous nation. As we bid adieu to him, to our great statesman, to this champion of peace, this champion of human rights and good governance, this embodiment of noble qualities and noble character, we pray that Alaji Sadawla Kairaba Jawara falls within that category of splendid servants of the Almighty, of whom the Almighty spoke in Surah al Bayina, quote, Verily, those who believe and do righteous deeds, they are the best of creatures. Their reward is with their Lord, guardians of eternity,
through which streams flow. They will abide therein forever. Allah is well pleased with them, and they too are well pleased with him. That is for him who fears his Lord." Unquote. I thank you very much for your patience.